Good evening, everyone. On behalf of Access Bank, I welcome you all to the eighth edition of Treasury Market Talks. Access Bank has been instrumental in serving a wide spectrum of customers through its innovative financial solutions and products, covering large and mid corporate, SME, agriculture, and retail businesses. The bank has leveraged the power of technology to provide uninterrupted services to its customers in these challenging times. Over the years, the bank has emerged as a well-respected thought leader within the banking industry. As part of its thought leadership initiatives, Access Bank has been organizing the Treasury Market Talks, a talk series hosted by its corporate banking team on diverse topics such as monetary and fiscal policy, geopolitical developments, international trade and economy, Indian economy and the financial markets. Several eminent speakers who are revered as experts in their respective areas of work internationally have spoken their mind on a variety of subjects as part of this initiative. The talk series has been received very well by all stakeholders with great enthusiasm and participation from leaders in the corporate world and other diverse fields. The discussion topic for the day is the pre-budget talk. And we have two guest speakers on our panel today leading them into the conversation and sharing in-house views will be Mr. Shagata Bhattacharya, our Chief Economist at Access Bank. Some housekeeping announcements before we begin. Participation in the webinar is by invitation only. Access Bank reserves the right to block access to any person to whom the invitation is not sent. Unauthorized dissemination of the contents of this webinar is strictly prohibited and prior explicit permission of Access Bank is imperative. As a reminder, all participant viewing panels will be on the view only mode. Participants who wish to ask questions may post them on the question box on your screens. Please note that this conference is being recorded and may involve the presence of the press or media. On behalf of Access Bank, I once again welcome all our customers to this webinar. I now hand over the forum to Mr. Shagato Bhattacharya. Thank you very much and over to you, Shagato. Thank you so much, Ajit. Uh, uh, delight to be here. Uh, let me welcome all our uh, distinguished guests, uh, our customers uh, to this to this program, uh, the Treasury Market Talks. Uh, joining me on this program, joining us on the program are two, I mean, incredibly distinguished people who do not need any introduction, but uh, for performance sake, I'm going to uh, say that anyway. Uh, so uh, Dr. Ila Patnaik, um, former uh, Principal Economic Advisor to the Government uh, of India and uh, noted uh, expert on, on, on our show, Ilanomics. Uh, Tamal, uh, uh, Tamal Bandapadhyay, uh, again, uh, author and journalist. I mean, you've all seen uh, his prolific writings, his prolific books, uh, and his much regarded column, weekly column, uh, Bankers Trust. So, again, I mean, with, uh, just this, uh, I'm just going to wade on forward. Uh, so incredibly topical uh, day uh, for for this for this TMT talk for you know, this TMT uh, discussion. Uh, the budget tomorrow. The economic survey is already out uh, today. Uh, I'm going to be very very brief on this. So uh, every year we say that the budget uh, is very very important, uh, but this year it actually does look like it is. Um, uh, it, it it does seem so. So first uh, after a couple of years. Uh, this time, uh, the fiscal policy and monetary policy sides will have to chart their own relatively independent courses. Uh, and uh, second, the foundations of broad-based uh, growth are still very fragile in India. So uh, I, I think uh, the role of the fiscal policy uh, this time is, is very, very, not just the budget, but the entire but the broader fiscal space, the use of this fiscal space uh, is extremely important. So what I propose to do, uh, so uh, uh, Ajit, uh, if I can just request you while uh, I'm, I'm discussing this, uh, just laying out the broad parameters, I'll, I'll be very, very brief in, in our uh, questions. The, the, the guests uh, will have their, uh, uh, their, their, their time. Uh, so if I can just request you to uh, put our uh, house view chart, yes, on the uh, screen, thank you. Uh, so this is while I just introduce the context of the, of the conversation. This is the backdrop or our house view. So the key macro parameters that we see uh, in FI22 and then uh, carrying on to FI23. Uh, some of these have already been validated by the uh, by the economic survey. Uh, so uh, obviously, I mean uh, the the key question of the budget uh, is from the expenditure side. Uh, the three key areas on infrastructure capex, uh, MSMEs, 
and a broader set of uh, subventions for the uh, for the vulnerable households, the lower income households is the expenditure side. So from the financing side of this uh, expenditure, uh, we will need to focus uh, on, on uh, the revenue streams uh, that are likely to play out, uh, how uh, the use of budgetary and extra budgetary uh, resources to finance this expenditure. And obviously this will have uh, key implications for the uh, for financing the, in, in, in terms of the government's borrowing program, uh, how to finance the gap between expenditure and revenues. You all know that. So I, we, we, we propose to split this discussion into four broad modules. Uh, one is the macroeconomic outlook and environment in which the budget, uh, the context of the budget uh, will be discussed. Uh, the second is the budget itself. Uh, how how much uh, uh, the what are the key re revenues receipt and expenditure items uh, for the budget uh, the third module uh, we, we propose to keep it as uh, the, from the market's angle i mean obviously the government's borrowing program is, will be very important uh, but together with this uh, what uh, the panelists guest views uh, are on interest rate uh, exchange rates etc uh, the, the the implications and outcome uh, of the budget, uh, uh, the, the budget contours of the budget. Uh, so that will be the main model uh, in the in this in this program. Uh, so initially, we'll keep the macro to about five, eight minutes, uh, the budget itself to probably about 10 minutes. We'll spend about 15 to 20 minutes uh, on the on the core, the market uh, module of the of the discussion. And the fourth we will try to, if time permits, uh, we'll, we'll try to have a longer term view uh, in terms of our potential growth, uh, in, in, in terms of where we see our output gap, what are the key reform things that need to be wrapped around the budget and the other fiscal measures, et cetera. We'll spend about five minutes on that. Uh, then we'll open up the floor uh, to question and answers. Uh, if, if there are any, any questions in between which are relevant to the topics that are then uh, being, being discussed in the budget, we'll, we'll be very happy to take that on as well. Uh, so that, that's something that we do. So without further ado, uh, I think let's start on this. We'll, we'll devote about uh, eight minutes, uh, Ila and Tamil, on this. Uh, so the macroeconomic and financial markets, uh, the financial backdrop, not the markets, the financial backdrop to the budget, uh, will take about uh, three, four minutes. So the key question, Ila, let me begin with you. Uh, on uh, one, we are going to likely to face much tighter external financial conditions uh, in 2022. Uh, and, and given your extensive uh, research in this area, what are the likely spillover channels uh, for the G10 uh, central banks as they progressively tighten through the course of the year? What are the channels and impacts that, are, that you see likely on India? Uh, how do you see the growth, uh, uh, the growth inflation trade-off playing in India? Uh, and, and, and generally, so we will we'll keep on there and, and uh, slowly get into durable recovery and demand. But those are the key. Uh, two key areas that I'd uh, uh, request you to address, please. So uh, we expect uh, the G10 to start uh, withdrawing on the monetary stimulus at least. So the Fed has already indicated that, the Bank of England has indicated that, that they will start uh, tightening. And the pace of tightening may actually be more aggressive than we thought it might be. Now, in terms of what it means for India, uh, first, it's not a surprise, unlike in the taper tantrum period, where it was a surprise in 2013, where the markets got very rattled. Uh, so it won't be a surprise. We are all expecting that this would happen. So that's something to keep in mind. So many people try to draw a parallel between what uh, happened in 2013 and the taper tantrum period and what, and is this going to be another taper tantrum? I think not, because the element of surprise is smaller. But the point is that there is a risk on risk of behavior because of which we can expect uh, capital flows to either reverse or certainly to shrink. Now, given that, uh, you know, so in Q1, we had a uh, current account surplus, but in Q2, we got back to a current account deficit. And if you look at the grow, uh, if you look at what's happening in terms of the uh, growth of exports and growth of imports, then growth of imports has been faster than the growth of exports. So what you might expect is that at this time, there might be uh, uh, either a smaller uh, inflow of capital outflows or a reversal, which might put pressure on the rupee. 
Now the question then is how is how are policymakers in India going to respond? Are they going to respond by further tightening monetary policy? I mean that's you know the 2013 sort of behavior where uh, you reduce the window for repo borrowing and so on uh, and took a number of measures or is it that you are going to allow uh, some depreciation or are you going to step in very heavily with your uh, mm, uh, you know reserves or using the reserves my sense is that uh, it's going to be a challenge first because uh, you know you on the one hand you might want to let the rupee appreciate because you know you want your exports to be more competitive but on the other hand you might worry about imported inflation and so given these two, uh, we might see some measures, uh, maybe not too much of a use of forex uh, reserves because in the past, you know, as you said, so that's what uh, most of my research has been. In the past, you see that while uh, RBI does intervene when the rupee is appreciating and buys up dollars, but it doesn't intervene that much when the rupee is depreciating. So it doesn't really use up its reserves at a very fast pace. But what it does do is bring in other measures. So, you know, some capital controls, margin requirements, some requirements on um, derivatives, uh, some margin requirements on derivatives and tightening liquidity conditions through various ways so that, you know, people don't bet on a depreciation. So we might see some of that. And uh, one concern, of course, that it does raise for growth is that are we going to see too much of a you know a knee jerk sort of tightening response that might actually give us a tightness in the market and reduce growth because we do understand that you know as the economy is trying to recover from the pandemic it does need uh, more liquidity and loose uh, easy liquidity conditions accommodative uh, liquidity conditions and that is something that we might start worrying about excellent uh, so again uh, uh, turning to you kamal uh, would you like to expand a little bit uh, on on uh, ila's uh, view i mean your own views on the macroeconomic conditions the growth inflation trade off in particular we just heard ila uh, and and then after that uh, i'd uh, really like you to address some some issues on credit credit flow because um, in, in addition to direct fiscal spending, uh, CapEx, revenue spending, etc., uh, incentivizing credit flows will be a very key component uh, to, to making growth more broad-based, particularly for the MSME segment, uh, which has been you know, parts of which the micro and small has been uh, uh, quite uh, evidently been hit uh, by, the, by, the, by, the, by the actions of the, the public health response uh, for the COVID. Please, I mean, yeah, yeah. your comments. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in the first part, I think Eli is an expert. She said more than I have nothing much to say. And all of us now, there is no disagreement about the so-called K-shaped recovery. Earlier, we were all looking for V, W, all kind of English letters were used uh, for my alphabet. But now I think everybody talks about K-shaped. We are seeing on the one hand record exports in, in December, what we have seen. And we are seeing the large corporate earnings, etc., etc. But on the other hand, uh, people who we interact every day, uh, the tea vendors uh, below my colony here, or or the sabji vendors, MSMEs, SMEs, and all, even smaller restaurants, uh, they're in a pretty pretty bad shape. So definitely, the challenge before the government is enormous. How do you how how do you actually address this? I would not like to go beyond that. Ila has explained everything, the other dilemmas. But let me talk about the credit growth bit that you very important thing are asking. I, I think the way of looking at credit growth needs to be different because we need to see credit growth through different prisms now. Allah, till recently, what was you look at WSS and everybody quotes that WSS is Reserve Bank of India's weekly statistical state, uh, statement that credit growth is this, that and all. So now I put it on my screen. If you say up to January 12, 2022, the latest, ER, there are three things. Year on year growth, it's 6.4%. Okay. Year so far, 
<coughs> sorry, year on year growth is 8% versus 6.4% last year. Year so far, 5% versus 2.6% last year. And the first fortnight of January, it's minus 1.6%. You go back to December end, which is more logical because that's the third quarter end. Year on year growth, 6.7%, which is double than the previous year, 3.2%. Year so far from April, growth is 9.2% versus 6.6%. And fortnight growth is 3.3%. Now, if you see in isolation, December credit growth is actually pretty good. And my understanding is this. After quite a few years, we will see the 10% double digit growth. Double digit growth we will see. So the so-called CapEx, et cetera, what you are talking about, I think there'll be some addressing will be with that. We will see double digit. That's point number one. Point number two is this. This credit growth is not primarily, it's continued to be, but not as strongly as it was till the December quarter that only driven by retail and and uh, uh, mortgage. It's not infra and solar energy also coming. You talk to the bankers, they will tell you that there's a lot of money set to go. Sanctions already happened, not always disbursement, both infrastructure and solar energy. Disbursement may take a little while, but this is something happening. And some of the private banks, of course, are growing little bigger growth than that. So finally, even this does not tell the entire credit growth story because there are many, many things outside which WSS does not catch, which is outside, you know, so-called buy now and pay later and all those kind of things, technology driven, uh, it's not an included. We are not, it's not included how much credit is coming from the bond market. You see the corporates now raising money from bond market. So all this put together, I am hopeful. I'm not getting into the comp uh, that the theoretical discussion with CapEx, etc. We will see for a change after a few years, positive, I mean, double digit credit with point number. That's point number one very quickly. Can our Tamal, 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 yeah. Tamal, sorry, sorry, keep keep that for I mean we will have a detailed module on the credit side later. Now so so that uh, let let's uh, move into into the budget segment in the, the module on the budget. Then will be uh, I I'll I'll take up on the credit side. I mean that because that's something very very important and particularly as uh, we discussed on MSMEs. I mean that's that's something which is very we'll come very to important. that later. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, so that that will be important. So let's move on to the second module in terms of the actual budget. Uh, so, given uh, both of your uh, views on on uh, growth uh, in the in the growth inflation trade off, that growth uh, will probably need to assume primacy uh, over over inflation. Although inflation concerns are, are relatively high, it's still high. Uh, so, first, uh, what is your uh, given given this need uh, given this assessment? Uh, uh, again, Ila, uh, let me start with you once again. Uh, so, what is your sense? Uh, you you've already addressed that to a certain extent uh, because I mean of your the focus on growth. Uh, you need to, to, to approach to use a counter cyclical approach uh, by which I mean, I mean, uh, you, you know, I mean, uh, so uh, wh what part would you would you recommend? I mean, any of the initial parts that we that we uh, discussed in terms of infra and capex led uh, spending versus uh, spending on MSMEs to a part which, which is credit. And, and then, of course, I mean, uh, revenue expenditures and subventions to the, to the uh, vulnerable segments of society. How would you structure? Uh, this this thing and the second major trade-off and again and I was following your analysis in terms of fiscal consolidation. If you were there in the in the in the hot seat, how would you phase uh, fiscal consolidation, the path, the light path of fiscal consolidation going forward? Okay, so I think the first important point to note is that this uh, is a K-shaped growth recovery at a time when you are going to be facing a big election. Uh, the UP election. Okay. Now, given that, of course, uh, central governments cannot do a lot of welfare programs uh, in times of general elections, when, uh, you know, they have uh, the election commission breathing down their necks and not allowing them to do so. But in the times of an assembly election, they, that restriction is not there. And 
I think one, this is a very important election, the UP election, and that this is a time when uh, you have to have, given the K-shape recovery and given the election, you have to have policies that will give relief to people. So the sort of things that Tamal talked about, you know, people who are clearly now facing a stress where the third wave was something they couldn't live with. I mean, you know, somehow they survived wave one and wave two, but the third wave if, is just killing for the very small, uh, very tiny self-employed for those businesses. So my sense is that on the one hand, the government needs to have some relief measures and again, there will be those maybe going directly to individuals because you have the Aadhaar infrastructure. So given that the Jandhan mobile Aadhaar, the jam infrastructure is there, so you can provide benefits. So for example, uh, last year benefits were provided to women uh, through the Aadhaar uh, Jandhan mobile structure or, or to handicapped old people. So like that, some ways will have to be found to address the extreme stress, uh, economic stress that uh, people have uh, faced. But second, uh, it, there has to be spending on CapEx. Now, the record for this year hasn't been very great, mainly because of the difficulties in spending in the midst of a pandemic. So just just to today, we had news on how the finance minister is telling other ministries that please meet uh, your expenditure targets, whatever you had to spend, go ahead and spend. If you also look at what the economic service is, that gives you an indication for the kind of uh, strategy, uh, which is that uh, we did not do just demand uh, push, we did supply easing, supply side, and that supply side is also something that is eased by investment in public infrastructure. And as the survey very clearly says, public infrastructure is something that helps the demand side, but it also helps the supply side. It lays the foundations for higher productivity growth, for attracting uh, private investment and so on. Now, when it comes to resources and fiscal consolidation, I think, again, the 67% increase in revenue growth that you have seen is, uh, and, and again, the survey saying that there is, uh, therefore, there is fiscal, uh, there is space for fiscal actions. That seems to suggest that you are not going to see a very tight path or very ambitious aims on uh, objectives or path uh, announced for fiscal consolidation. It seems to suggest that because you have higher tax revenues, the uh, budgetary, uh, the forecasts or rather, you know, the estimates that are made for tax revenue could be higher. Uh, you know, given that they're, you know, talking about eight and a half, eight and a half percent growth next year, those targets could be high, maybe some positive uh, elasticity uh, of tax revenue there because of what you've seen in the last uh, year. And I don't expect a very big number in terms of borrowing. So the borrowing number won't be way off, but I expect that the expenditure number will be higher than what we might have thought based on the higher tax revenue collection number. Now, of course, there will be issues with non-tax revenue, but we can come to those later. Excellent. Excellent. So uh, one more thing, please remind me uh, if I forget to bring that in somewhere uh, during the course of the discussion uh, is the is your sense, both of you, Tamal and, and uh, Ila, both of you, uh, in, in terms of the uh, your sense, in, in terms of how the sovereign credit rating agencies uh, might uh, view this strategy or, or what, what are the likely. So we'll, we'll come back to that uh, some point in time. Uh, so Kamal, again, uh, in, in terms of the budget, the revenue and expenditures, I would like you to focus, following on from your uh, the earlier uh, earlier statements, credit once again, I mean, because this is this is something which Again, uh, for me as part of a bank, and you are the seasoned uh, banking sector analyst. What what do you see? How does one how does one use fiscal levers to incentivize credit? Uh, the ECLGS program, of which I, I think you have been a big votary, 
uh, I think that's uh, been a very good template. How would you, I mean, if you were in the hot seat, how would you uh, build on the ECLGS, expand the scope, use other credit guarantee, backstop measures, et cetera, uh, to try to incentivize credit, particularly your uh, uh, your segment, the one that you espouse so much, MSMEs. Absolutely. Uh, before there are just two small pointers which I wanted to add, and you rightly stopped me. I'm, I'm glad that if I talk shit, if I talk more, <laughs> cut it off. So uh, the the year on year uh, deposit growth this time is pretty bad. Oh. You know, it's 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 unusual. Nine point three percent versus eleven point four percent. I'm talking about. So typic, uh, uh, this is year on year, and year so far is 5.8% versus 7.8%. It's not normal. If you go back to the five years, I think probably only one year was there, which is uh, credit, credit growth was little less than the previous year. Otherwise, credit growth is always on positive, this time not, because of the exuberance of equity market. Now, equity market is in volatile mode. I hear from the bankers that money is coming to banks again. Okay, and of course, you have seen that bankers have started raising their deposit rates. That's one part of it. And second part of is this Reserve Bank of India's uh, December uh, FSR report spoke about bankers, how banks are well capitalized, 16.6% capitalized and TR1 leverage ratio is 7.5%. So, I mean, from the back end, there should not be any problem. Now, the real question, as you rightly asked me, what's happening? MSME is actually kind of, even though the bankers are like, you know, chest thumping that we are taking care of everything, everything is pretty good and all. I have my own uh, reservations. It's a bit of a black box. I'm going through some numbers. I'm expecting that you would need some critical numbers. I did work on that. April 2022, MSME total contribution was 10.84 trillion april 2022 just onset of just onset of covid that's what i picked up the number the 10.84 trillion now april 2021 it has actually come down to 10.67 trillion and may 2021 is 10.35 trillion okay as we speak in october 2021 MSME is 11 point gone up 11.21 trillion. So it's correct. Bankers are actually supporting, even though I'm just saying to what extent, I don't know, but it has gone up. And in percentage term also, uh, it, it is on an average, if you see historic percentage is like 10% plus that kind of thing remained. Barring a few years, September 20 and April 2019, it was 11%. Otherwise, it's 10% plus. I mean, now it's 10% plus. But having said that, MSME is still a, a pain point because everywhere you, you will see that they are the mentors, entire supply chain. MSMEs plays the role, whether it's big corporate, whether it's Maruti, whether it's everywhere. They are the guys, they are suppliers, and they have been, they have been divided. You must be knowing, I'm not going to name, some of the FMCG companies are saying, look, if you want to sell my stuff, which you have already been doing, earlier they are giving them 90-day credit. You pick up the stuff, you sell, and then go back. And now that has been stopped. It's now you pay and pick up. But when it comes to paying the suppliers, their own suppliers, they don't follow that. They continue to follow this 90 day or kind of thing and all. So MSMEs are in a bit of a situation continuously, but things are looking apparently rosy because of large scale restructuring. If you ask the bankers, maximum restructuring happened in the MSME segment. But having said this, as a percentage term, that is overall bank's portfolio, that restructuring is not too to too much. So we need to wait and watch, but definitely it's a pain point. And quickly on this ECLJS program, I think this is one of the best thing, if you ask me, uh, which uh, the COVID time uh, final minister over a period of time, about six days or seven days, she was explaining things. We are, a lot of us are very critical and uh, about the total number and how it's been created, so on and so forth. But the, it is a winner, the, the the, this particular scheme because what happening is this this is going to the people who actually need not debt they, they have they have eaten up their capital and it's taken care of their capital i look at it this way at this point of time this this is actually using 
and bankers are offering them in the form not saying it as much but those who needed capital instead of debt their capital and how it has been progressively expanded o 0.2 0.1 0.2 0.3 so more and more more and more sectors etc exactly happen so right now i i have the number till mid november 2.82 lakh crore 2.82 trillion credit guarantee has been given okay out of 4.5 so roughly more than 50% has been already given now our scheme is expanded till 31st march and this for 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 sanctioning and disbursement till 30th june so still time is there okay and my understanding finally 95% of this money is going to msme segment and as you know all of us know government also that's also a very good move they have restructure reconfigured what is called msme it's a turnover base so relatively larger company which otherwise would not have got into this category because of the redefining the profile of msme they are now msme and they are getting so so this particular scheme is i mean if i say if we if, if i mean we're going very euphoric that it's a great success i would not like to say but this has immense potential and i think because of this whatever we are saying uh, the the so called recovery is happening even in the lower segment even though it's a k shaped is because of that scheme and still time is left up to march sanction can happen up to june money can go and bankers are on their own also being forced by the government is seriously considering giving money i stop here excellent 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 so uh, thank you uh, one take let me uh, so uh, th this this we now uh, come to the uh, the crux of the macro and the budget numbers uh, the the implications of what uh, our, our speakers today have described as uh, their preferred uh, uh, action uh, for for uh, durable uh, sustainable enduring growth uh ila again i mean so i'm going to start with you once again on this uh, in terms of your assessment now uh, the center and the states uh, fiscal deficits etc are the numbers that you would be working with uh what's your call now on uh, the borrowing program the pressure on uh, uh, on the on the of the borrowing program i i you, you mentioned that they are going to be re relatively uh, reticent about expanding the borrowing program uh one of the key things that is of concern uh, this time round is uh, uh is the fact that reserve bank uh, and monetary policy in general probably will not be able to, to support uh, the the borrowing government's borrowing program uh and and the state governments also are expected to have a fairly large uh, program so how do you see this because i mean this this flows in into interest rates etc uh how do you see this uh, this playing out i'll come back separately to the monetary policy part but just from a fiscal side uh how do you see yield curves uh, moving uh, over the next year at least uh so my sense is that uh, for the current year uh the 6.8 uh may actually be maybe even 6.5 or 6.6 .6. so they are uh, the borrowing uh, would at the end of the year when tomorrow the we'll know tomorrow when the numbers come out maybe i'm sticking my neck out unnecessarily but uh, i feel that actually uh, revenues uh, tax revenues might have been better and because tax revenues might have been better uh, this they would have met their uh, deficit but even perhaps you know been a little borrowing would have been a little less for next year uh, now i am expecting that given the success of air india uh, even though you know it's towards the end of the year and the 1.75 uh, for the non tax revenue was certainly not met i think they've collected around 9000 crores only maybe another two announced today so not have 10000 crores but my sense is that they might do a large uh, program of disinvestment next year and so the actual borrowing so they might come up with a say a deficit number of 6.5 let's you know rough roughly 6.5 6.6 and then what will happen is that if 
so, you know, so sorry so this is this is fi23 you are talking about the next deal yeah i'm talking okay. of fi23 and then uh, what will actually happen will depend on whether there is uh, the um, both the bureaucratic uh, processes in place and the political will to push through more disinvestment so you know you if if this year was 1.75 and next year they could be ambitious they could continue to be ambitious they could put two numbers to two private sector banks that have been announced but no numbers were put on that so you could see that and if you see that then your deficit would stay maybe about 6.5 in the 2223 fi so that's roughly okay. my that's roughly my sense but let's see tomorrow Excellent. Uh, do you have any any sense on uh, the RBI's dividend transfer? I mean, any numbers that you are working with or uh, uh, something? You see, RBI uh, actually should be doing a lot bigger uh, dividend transfer than it has been doing in the past years. In the couple of last two couple of years, because it became obvious that they were keeping much beyond. they were calling them contingency funds and reserves and so on and they were so there so there's this one part which is because of revaluation uh because you know so the say the rupee was uh, 10 when uh, the dollar was purchased and then now the rupee is uh, 75 and that difference is the revaluation uh, the uh, part that gets counted as revaluation and there's that reserves which i don't think that they will touch but i think that in terms of contingency uh, reserves and some of the other reserves they may hold back less because they actually don't bail out banks so in india so the money that they keep back for bailing out banks is never used because it's not the rbi with bail out banks it is the public sector banks so okay. Okay. if the government should be able to persuade them to hand over that Full maybe sixty, seventy, eighty thousand crores, maybe one lakh crores. Let's see. So let's see. Good. See. So uh, uh, Tamil, coming back to you uh, on this. So today itself, I mean, you have been writing uh, very, I mean, you know, prolifically on on uh, the the budget, the expectations of budget, and today's uh, business standard carried a very large article where you have detailed uh, your your sense of uh, revenues and expenditures. uh the I'm, i'm going to come to you from the from the one of course is this rbi thing but that's as a quota uh to what you have written today in terms of the borrowing program so what's your sense of the borrowing program uh, your sense of the financing of the borrowing program because that's very important yeah. part sure. of how yeah, it's going sure. to i am i am i am avoiding uh because fiscal deficit etc that is ila's domain she is an expert so i would not i would not like to add anything there so typically if you see this this year borrowing program gross was about 12 trillion and net has been 9 trillion okay actual budget it is 9.4 trillion net borrowing i am talking about but i think they will continue to is 9 trillion and this is despite the fact that government actually it on itself absorbed 1.5 trillion gst money that they had given the compensation to the states so it's a fairly good year this year they have done what's going to be the next year i think ila also men um, able said may uh, hinted at that i think grossly it will be remain the same the gross program will be between 12.25 up to 13.25 trillion that's the kind of gross program but there's a catch there i would like to believe there will be some switch operations you know what is switch a mechanism where that replaces existing shorter duration with longer durations what i was i what i was saying that theoretically this year's gross borrowing would likely to be more but they will manage by creating some such kinds of switch ahead of the year end so that the gross borrowing also remain the same that's about the state that's about the government borrowing so nothing much to be worried about uh, because we are now used to have this kind of high borrowing which is which is no which was not the case earlier so but it's not be even higher but the other point which everybody talks about is the state government borrowing that's very very critical this year because uh, i mean current year uh, next year because this year is 7.7 trillion now theoretically it can go up because you know that five year arrangement of gst which the state will 
be compensated by government state by center for the shortfall which ends in june 2022 what does it mean the states will stop getting money from center so does that that's mean clearly there is a possibility of borrowing program going up but my understanding is it's not that one deadline it gets over because there is a lot of residual money still state needs from the government etc it will continue so so far i think i would not be too much of worried about that uh, kind of uh, about the borrowing but the point is if the credit demand is going which i said and i stick my neck out this year year ending march we will see double digit growth after quite a few years in that case how would you how do you continue to make this debt as this borrowing so which is why inclusion of our global bond index is very very you have not said that am i would you mind me telling that you is that? exactly where i was yeah. uh, coming in because both of you have your ears to the ground yeah. so i'd so, ask both of you on this that what's yeah. your so, sense so, the timelines so for the increase so this is very very critical i have i i i know that they have been they, it's been it's been working on so global bond index there has to be there will be impact or that it happened now Uh, all of us are aware it's 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 nothing open about it uh, nothing secret about it rbi has its reservations because some serious geopolitical event could actually blow off the risk premium on which you don't have any control because somebody holds the money i mean how do you do it something happens uh, which is the rbi was there but my understanding rbi now softening its stance preparation is on it is as intense preparation as lic ipo that we could see it might see it in budget announcing that and if you see the government has already started because over the very so many of this is the so called far fully accessible route all the new 10 year papers longer papers coming fully accessible route far which means there is no restrictions of how much a, a foreigner can buy so that's that's already been preparing his ground only issue at this point of time and which they are spending i think midless na- sleepless nights with the contentious issue of taxation now yes euro clear platform that you know it is like cc uh, our our ccil locally europe euro clear is the global platform it can take care of every everything or bond buying and selling and all boy but how do you how do you address the taxation problem i mean there are two sets of issue can you have both capital gains as well as withholding tax so that's the problem that's the problem uh, can you have two like capital gains for sam and withholding for sam so so i think that's the biggest problem rbi okay. can sort it out and okay. if you allow me you must have seen the latest reserve bank of india paper on on fine tuning the holding of structure now rbi yeah. says of course it's a discussion paper and it is one way down the line that now banks can have entire thing in htm so it, tamal, tamal 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 hold on, hold hold on to that thought very important thought the htm uh, the new uh, the prudential classification and uh, etc no so i mean that that's a separate issue of discussion i mean i i think that's a whether you consider it as, as a stop gap measure but ila i'm going to throw this question back to you once again given your uh, your your deadly Uh, uh, your Delhi antennas uh, out there. How do you see? What, what? How do you see the timelines of the uh, the bond in index inclusion uh, progressing? So you see, we've been discussing this from 2015 onwards, and there have been two major obstacles in uh, on on this. And uh, Tamal has actually talked about both of them. And uh, let me just, from the Delhi point of view, uh, you know, tell you loud and clear that one is this Bombay obstacle. which is the reserve bank of india which seems to think that uh, uh, regardless of the fact that uh, you know it's been given an inflation targeting mandate by parliament and so on and so forth that it's a, its may primary job is to keep the rupee stable and what uh, inclusion in the bond index does it increases the risk of uh, volatility in the exchange rate and that volatility can come from uh, some action of the fed can come from ukraine can come from brazil russia mexico god alone knows where so the reserve bank of india has 
uh, you know, while it continues to do discussions and talks and for a very long time, I mean, I, I've been I've, I've been watching these since 2015 and for a, a very long time, this discussion has been continuing that, you know, uh, and, and a lot of progress has been made in not not in the inclusion in the index, but, you know, a lot of opening of the uh, GOI debt uh, has been made. So that's it. But still, the RBI is very conservative on this issue and does not uh, want the risk of higher rupee ball if you include it in the index. Now, the second uh, problem arises from Delhi. The, that is the tax man. That if they are getting even one rupee, you know, even if uh, the nation loses, even if uh, government has to pay higher yield higher uh, uh, interest total interest burden on the government goes down uh, and you know if i were to compare the two amounts so suppose you know the at the end of the day by inclusion in the index and by availability of lower uh, of money which is cheaper suppose the government of india gains a thousand crores but if the tax department collects 50 crore less of tax revenue they will oppose it so they treat tax as sacrosanct and there is this battle that has been going on that always goes on that okay there is the withholding tax and shall you know government uh, so, so you know discussion will happen within the ministry but the tax department will always oppose anything that would lead to a reduction in their tax collection so with these two I wish the finance minister all the very best so that we actually see these two, her, her you know, uh, being able to cross these two hurdles of the Reserve Bank of India and of the Department of Revenue and that we do see progress on this. Good. So I, I, I think we, we are, as Tamal also mentioned, the Bombay problem seems to have uh, now become much more ameliorated. Uh, hopefully the Delhi problem too. I mean, given the numbers, I mean, any rational policy making will will move forward very quickly on this. So, I mean, I, I wanted to yeah, segue in your views. I mean, I, I think we are running out of time. I mean, so uh, uh, we, we need to, uh, so I mean, uh, segueing your views on the rupee vols, uh, rupee volatility, etc. How do you see the rupee playing out? I mean, this is this is something that uh, maybe maybe just to say, uh, I mean, your views on, on the various drivers of the rupee, how do you see the rupee? So this this year this year you know given that the fed uh, and the g10 uh, central banks are going to tighten i see the rupee as more volatile perhaps than it has been in the past you know naturally the capital flows do respond and also when there has been a period of so much easy money and money trying to find uh, attractive places to invest in and that money has been sloshing around and will move around and will move back and forth so i expect currency markets and this is not just about the rupee this is you know emerging economy currency emerging market currencies this is about currency markets as a whole this year should be you know we should expect them to be volatile because you know these are prices that jump on news on expectations and you know it's an asset price you, you one should primarily see the rupee in this period as an asset price which is going to respond to news and this year you know if the world goes back to normal you may actually see a more aggressive uh, tightening and so you may see a lot more volatility than you might have excellent so again, uh, so this that's part on the on the uh, effects, uh, the currencies. Uh, Tamal, now I'm going to come back because I mean uh, we don't know what the timelines are likely to be on the bond index inclusion. Uh, so given the gap that the reserve banks last year they they would have done easily about 2.2 uh, net uh, OMO uh, buys, so which which are not being able, which they will probably not be able to do that the, the extent GSATs, OMOs, etc. So you need to have a new set of marginal uh, buyers for for this uh, for this gap. Now, uh, in this context, what you began uh, with the new discussion paper from the Reserve Bank on HTM eligibility, etc. Uh, uh, request you to please uh, uh, briefly again. I mean, because again, very little. Little. It's, it's very brief. Uh, it's very brief because it's one way down the line. 
if at all it comes it will be only for the fiscal year 2024 so april 23 but it's a very interesting thing i think the rbi as we are looking at it that it's a, it's in sync with the global accounting norms i'm not getting into, into the technicalities because why would bank lose capital on this you know because of the mark to market loss you know so you have the 100% hdm and in addition to that uh, even though you have very literate audience which are very familiar with this still i don't want to get into all those there are a lot of other issues like how much how much you can shift from h to m to uh, the, to sell category when 5% so on and so forth but the net result i find two thing one is this the bank's flexibility of managing their treasury and making money that gets limited unless you are a, uh, unless you are those kind of banks which are super efficient which our public sector banks probably would not take much of a risk so that's on the negative side banks ability to pick money from treasury and on the other side is this actually it will encourage lazy banking you know <laughs> hold on why i am saying is that max old uh, old lazy banking so your bank also today giving 20 year loan probably at 6.4% right and then uh, you have run the risk of uh, your guys are leaving there is some fellows are coming average nobody is kidding to you but to be on 2 or 3% money going and all but at hdm so since you, there is no mark to market you can hold on to it now if you get 7.2 for a 20 year money you rather put entire money in 7.2 in 20 year money instead of getting into all yeah. this retail bond and all so my yeah. apprehension i don't see any conspiracy that you know just to ensure that higher government borrowing has been done and all but i think it needs to deeper discussion a banks ability and flexibility to make treasury income high treasury income contributing to your bottom line which is critical for your investors and your balance sheet that that's that's in questions and b which worries me more i think we will go back to the days of lazy banking i'll put money in long term securities i know i have nothing to lose and it's zero risk so why do i get into all kind of other issues earn money and okay. do this done so i mean on this uh, on this optimistic note uh, back to the old 2003 days uh, with former deputy governor uh, thing so uh, some questions now uh, coming in and we will move greatly i mean forget about the long the medium term uh, story uh, questions coming in and which probably do pertain to the to the medium term uh, so this is again uh, uh, ila uh, for you uh, one question uh, on on multipliers so what is the government's belief on multipliers i i know there have been studies you probably have done some analytic work on this what is the government believes on multiplier of capital and and revenue expenditure uh, can capex change the trajectory of uh, potential growth so i think there is a firm belief in government that uh, capex and particularly infra uh, investment has very big multipliers now i don't think any specific numbers have been put though in today's economic survey there is a subsection on multipliers which i couldn't get to read because it's I, there wasn't time enough but there is a section there so maybe there's something uh, a number there but typically the belief in the government is that uh, it's you know so even if consumption gives you an instant multiplier in that fiscal year but if you invest in capex it actually gives you it crowds in so there's a belief that uh, public investment in infrastructure crowds in private investment and so the total multiplier that you have is much larger first much larger and second not just restricted to this year but over a multi year period and you see this uh, in the you, you know you you see the implication of this in the uh, kind of uh, you know the gati shakti and the national investment pipeline and the additional projects that have been added and so the whole approach has been that we increase uh, public investment in infrastructure rather than consumption demand so you you actually see that in the policy excellent so i am also going to follow up on the economic survey uh, the the section on on the capex multipliers uh, so uh, other set of questions coming in and i think this is uh, relevant because i was planning to do this separately anyway 
uh, in this third module. Uh, so the question for both of you, uh, starting with Tamam uh, and then you, Ila, is uh, what are your expectations? I mean, of course, tomorrow uh, will will shape uh, uh, how much uh, the fiscal policy uh, will 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 will. Well, I'm not going to say dominance, but uh, some fiscal policy shaping the monetary policy stance. Uh, but Kamal, starting with you, uh, what is what is your sense on uh, uh, on how Reserve Bank and MPC uh, will will uh, respond to policy and how they are going to uh, sequence the normalization steps? Let me start. Okay, with uh, one is one is what they should do, and what it one is what they will do, right? Now. My understanding is, and if you see one of the deputy governors, uh, David yesterday made a speech. Uh, that speech does not give any any new light. It continues to say that we need the growth to be secured, and we also keep a hawk eye on inflation. And even though globally now the approach to inflation, which was transitory, now no more. It's it's changed. If you see the Fed uh, documentary, etc., there it's no more that supply side bottleneck, etc., etc. Now inflation is very stable. So Fed has already committed uh, uh, to hike rates and also withdrawing all kind of accommodation uh, for the for a I think after a long time since 2004 I think after 16 years we'll see Bank of England is hiking rate at two consecutive MPC meeting Thursday is their meeting so this is the G10 scenario which uh, Ila Ila uh, Ila have spoken about I don't want to talk, uh, I don't want to add more but I think our stance is as if you, if you speak to people who are in the know well for the heck of it man we are already started normalization process we are not saying this and as a journalist we call it normalization by stealth so what are you talking about 3.3 percent uh, reverse repo rate actually it's gone to four percent because reverse repo is no more important. We are going through this variable reverse repo VRR. So we have already done that. That's the kind of approach I think RBI body language even now says. So as we speak, call money has gone to 4.5%. Now 10 year paper 6.74, which is 50 basis point what it was some time back. One year OIS, if you look at it, 4.48. All pricing, all are pricing hike. 182 treasury bill is 4.18 which was 3.5 364 day treasury bill is 4.5 which was 3.70 so all indications are market have already priced in now the challenge before reserve bank of india is this it is will it accept the narrative and reconfirm it and tell us look we are now going to from accommodation to at least neutralization or Will it keep its eyes closed and say, no, we have already done it. We'll see. And of course, there is always an excuse that uh, that uh, um, uh, that um, so, your your other so, repo rate, so, other repo, I mean, not the repo rate, the, uh, the repo rate at which is the bank of India think that is not to be not in the not in the report, not in the uh, domain of or remit of MPC. We can do it. We can do it any other and any other time so 3.35 we don't need to bring it up right now we can do it even outside MPC. outside so MPC. That, that that's your that's your call is it i mean no, uh, in no, the february I'm policy not my call not my call i think my my call should be reserve bank of india should hike the reverse repo rate at this point in time and should probably two to three hikes in future but will rbi do it i do not know and finally i think you will see uh, current governor's uh, uh, six year term, he has got six year very rarely, will be split into two. First three year, only rate cut, and next three year beginning now, only rate hike. Wow. There's no so other that, option. That's something. Okay. So, Ila, uh, uh, you completely, I mean, I saw that you were uh, smiling. So, I mean, your, your, your take on this. I, you 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 used to be a little bit more on the hawkish side. I mean, if I if I could, uh, I mean, I don't know whether that's a fair characterization. So, so uh, you know, I was on the side of targeting inflation and keeping it within a band, which people call hawkish when a central bank is targeting exchange rates. So call it hawkish, call it non-hawkish, but uh, not that it has to 
that we're always having to we should always tighten monetary policy no so that was not my stand my stance because you know i started writing about inflation targeting in 2006 when we had these big conflicts with you know build up of reserves and too much and the partial sterilization and you know too much liquidity in the markets and so on so it was coming at it from that point and then when we worked on it further that that remained my stance but but you know it's this is not about my stance and what I think. Let, let me go back to uh, the RBI and policymakers. So government and RBI. Now I, I thought the economic survey was actually very interesting in the uh, the prices chapter. Okay, so if you go to the prices chapter, it says that prices are within the target, and India is one of those few countries which has kept prices within the band of so the inflation band that we have. And right in the beginning, in the first chapter, they quote the December number, which is like five point whatever and then later they go back to the uh, in the in the full chapter they go back to it's a long chapter but fundamentally i think it basically says that we are fine uh, that we have some imported inflation issues uh, those are pointed out but at least when i looked for whether there is an indication of uh, monetary tightening or a sense that this there is some there are demand pressures on uh, inflation uh, and on prices that sense was not there now why would i look at the economic survey which is coming from the government of india whereas the uh, policy is made by the mpc i think everything that tamal said answers that so i'm not going to go into that but uh, i don't expect them to start raising repo rates uh, because of these signals that I am seeing. And they might continue to do uh, monetary policy by stealth, Tamal. Is that what you called it? Uh, or at least that's what you meant, that they there's doing all those things that the MPC does not. So MPC basically has a right to determine the uh, repo rate. Oh. But then you can do a lot of other things. You lose a lot, use a lot of other instruments. So you do a bit of tightening, but you take the uh, public stance that whatever we have done is right and we will continue to focus on uh, growth and that because inflation is fine. I think that uh, the turning around point may not have come yet. Again, I could be sticking my neck out and within a few days they might uh, in reverse the, you know, they might reverse this and they might increase the repo rate. Uh, I hope they do. But I think there is not yet a public acknowledgement of the fact that inflation is here to stay. There is not yet a public uh, acknowledgement of the fact that we might need to start tightening now because we don't want inflationary expectations to become entrenched in the economy. And there is a danger of currently that happening. So uh, to, to, I mean, uh, again, maybe an uh, unfair characterization. Uh, so what I hear from both of you is that you think even the reverse repo uh, hike will probably be postponed by yet one more policy uh, review. And uh, but all both of you prob think probably think uh, that there should be a start to the normalization process uh, very quickly uh, so that uh, I mean, uh, that, that might not be that that's my own uh, sense as well that uh, you know in that uh, acknowledgement yeah yeah, hey, Shubhato, yeah yes what we said is this normalization has already started yes without saying so yes now repo rate hike is little away there's no question yes. the question is should rbi do reverse repo rate hike or not there is the yes. question rbi might yes. say we don't need to because it is outside MPC remit, we can do any time or we have already yeah. done our work. So they are, yes. my point of view is this, you actually, you should hike it. And if you talk, if you don't do it, then later it has to be little jerky reactions uh, um, and you have to do it much faster. And one more addition is this, the so-called third wave impact. I'm afraid it's not that much. If we use this third wave impact as an excuse and wait and watch, growth secured, Bombay schools are all open. What happened? I am, I, I self had last year, last week I was in COVID, pull up this thing. It's nothing but flu. So, and you see hospitalizations and other things and all. So I think we are a little exaggerating for whatever reason the third wave impact on economy. I, I, I don't see great impact of the third wave. 
which which can determine uh, this kind of critical scenario so again uh, uh, i i i think uh, we are now uh, i i do want to keep uh, to stick to the timelines and r is an r uh, we have actually overshot a little bit there are multiple questions that i see on the on the chat box i i don't know whether uh, i i uh, we should uh, get into one last final question uh, so this is something that uh, uh, i i this is of interest to me and coming in from both the delhi and the mumbai perspectives uh, because trade is is being looked upon as a very significant engine of growth i mean uh, in the, the medium term at least given the pli is given other the ftas etc so how do you think i mean you know i mean and and these things again will take time uh so what what is particularly you uh, uh, delhi based what is the thinking on uh, these bilateral trade treaties uh, that that we are now seeing the early harvest deals the uh, things what, what what do you sense very very briefly again i mean i, I don't want to keep you guys although i mean the, the export uh, the, the question box is so, so full so i don't see a consensus uh, yet on what should be done so you know there there are uh, points of view which are like we should push exports and push uh, trade through various schemes and then there is a point of view that no what you need to do is to make the entire economy competitive which would also mean energy sector reforms tax reforms less intrusive tax man lower custom duties so there do, these are actually two opposite uh, you know the, these are the two ends of the spectrum one end saying that uh, what you need are fully big big entire economy reforms so that then you can actually become competitive and you can be exporting and the other which is that you can you know just find pockets you can find maybe a hundred pockets push through uh, scz's you know something like maybe a bit, bit like the china model and that you'll be able to succeed now i'm not sure where uh, the the bilateral treaties fall in between because uh, on the one hand whenever you do a bilateral treaty whenever india does a bilateral treaty it is india that ends up cutting uh, import duties because usually our partners already have lower duties so uh, i mean what is the treaty then if we are the ones who are going to in a bilateral treaty we are not joining an rcep or something but you know just in say uh, india singapore singapore already has 4% custom duties if we have 20 and we cut them down to 4 then we could have done it even without the treaty then why do a treaty with singapore so you know there is this thing of what are we doing bilateral treaties for and then come the bits the bits are even more controversial so these are the by investment treaties and investment treaties in and in those i mean you want to bring fdi in but if you tell uh, the uh, partner the investor that you you it's not indian courts but it is uh, an international arbitration will not be good enough you'll have to settle the matters in indian courts that that's a you know it just completely breaks down the uh, negotiations so that's why we've not signed any bits so i i feel that today uh, in delhi there is no consensus on the direction in which this needs to go we will keep pushing some treaty or the other we will keep pushing some pockets of exports some in sectors some pockets which of course will have some positives but we will not be going all out to Uh, push exports by making the economy competitive because again you know you have the rbi and the tax man those two always stand in the way okay so uh, i'm I'm, uh, i'm going to bring this now to a close uh, we are, we are significantly above time kamal i would have loved to have heard your views uh, on uh, banking sector and the financial sector space consolidation in this space uh so i i don't i mean uh, i i don't really know whether we, we should we should get into this this is unfair on both of you as well uh to keep you much beyond your uh, the indicated time uh and uh, but do you want to take one minute to uh, close out on the financial sector consolidation okay uh, very 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 fast is um, 
so we have it i mean there's nothing new to say we have a banglet financial system but if you see the things are slightly changing if you look at again there's a bank of india december fsr report it talks about the contribution of a mutual fund they have contributed in a, in a very big way much bigger than the insurance things and all nbfcs are in trouble uh, but again uh, they, they have contribution to 27.4 trillion uh, credit come from nbfcs and they are changing rules of the game are changing we are all we are all aware of that account aggregator system how things are happening there so i think this account aggregator and uh, technology of course all put together so things are it's not the banklet system anymore as we speak yes but maybe 5 years down the line we'll see there are multiple ways of getting credit as far as consolidation is concerned i think uh, it's still i mean we have not got that great benefit out of it by to making 26 bank to 11 something like that two banks are on the two banks are uh, on the block <laughs> if we may say yes. so for privatization but they have not yet identified is not going to happen idbi again no, not not going to happen i'm talking about this year yes uh, yes the uh, air india thing happened but this is actually a stop loss the government has not made any money okay so yeah. i i if you ask me to i think there are uh, i i today also i mentioned that uh, there are everything if you see that there are intention and there are uh, if i may read out what i wrote is this it's uh, the signs of recovery are lovely bright and deep still the finance minister have many promises to keep so <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yes, so thanks so to well, well, to go on that on that uh, bright note Uh, uh, well, uh, we are all looking forward to uh, the 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 budget tomorrow. Thank you so much, both of you, Ila and Tamil, for this for this wonderful discourse. I see I have a backlog of thirty questions in the in the chat box, but uh, that that's for the next round whenever we come in. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you our our guests, our customers uh, for joining in the call. Uh, Ajit, uh, whoever uh, Ishan wants to uh, come in and wrap up. Uh, my apology is really that uh, we we uh, went overboard on time, uh, but it was a fascinating. Time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sagar. Uh, on behalf of Access Bank, uh, that concludes this webinar. I would like to take a moment to convey our gratitude to our external panelists, uh, Dr. Ila Patnaik and Mr. Tamal Bandhapadhyay, for taking out their valuable time. We look forward to all our customers joining us soon on our next edition of the Treasury Market Talks. Uh, recording will be available uh, for this webinar in case you wish to have this passed on to your colleagues. Do connect with your RMs for help. Once again, thank you all for joining us. Uh, you may now log out of the webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Stay safe. Thank you.